Good day, Brian. It's so good to be here. Here we are on the last Sunday of November, folks. Next week, we enter the season of Advent in the church calendar. And wherever you are, uh, wherever you're listening to this or watching this, whether it's close by or far away, as a follower of Christ, I'm, I'm so excited about this time of year that we can join together even though we're not together physically but on that church calendar as we prepare and to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. John Bloom begins his article by pointing the reader to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And if you're familiar with that letter to the Corinthian church, it's often called, that chapter 13 is often called the love chapter. And 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 5 goes like this. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. And the it here in verse 5 refers to love. And Bloom correctly points out that the Apostle Paul was describing expressions of biblical love in this letter. And isn't that a wonderful notion that Paul describes in chapter 13 of his letter to the church at Corinth? It radiates as heartwarming and, and moving and from here, Bloom moves into his first major point, where he suggests that when you and I are called upon to exercise this kind of biblical love in our lives, we struggle with the whole idea. It often doesn't feel very heartwarming or moving. It sometimes feels confusing and annoying. And at other times, it's like we're denying ourselves. So why is this so? Well, let Bloom tell us why. Quote, Wanting our own way is woven into the fabric of our fallen nature. Since the fall, it has been our default orientation. We can see this even from our earliest days, whenever we were crossed. We insist in the cradle, we insist in the playground, on the playground, and then as overconfident teens. We insist in church and the workplace, we insist as parents of toddlers, and then as stubborn parents of overconfident teens. We insist as parents of adult children, and then as retirees, and then as nursing home residents. And then he describes what, what it means to be living in a fallen world and having a sinful human nature. We are, he goes on to say, we are disturbingly and persistently selfish. End quote. The year was 1758, 265 years ago. And at the age of 22, pastor and hymn writer Robert Robinson penned the words to the hymn, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing. And over the years, uh, Robinson's hymn continued, continues to serve the church in many ways. And this hymn has also morphed into various in arrangements over the years, even in contemporary Christian music. For me, it was a consistent favorite as a member of the student body in my seminary days, seminary days during the chapel uh, time. That wasn't too long ago. In the original text, when we look at this hymn, contains five stanzas. And stanza number four highlights for us the truth of Bloom's thesis in his article. And it goes like this. Bind my wandering heart to thee, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Well, Bloom, I think, hit it right on the nail head. Indeed, we are disturbingly and persistently selfish creatures. As we think about the time, as I mentioned, uh, we here are the last Sunday uh, of, Advent, of uh, November, moving into the Advent season. And what is Advent? Well, really, it's just a time of preparation for the celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we need to realize that there will be a competition during this season of Advent and preparation for our time, our treasure and talent uh, from our culture and even from our families and friends. And in the tension between preparing for and celebrating the birth of the Messiah and the culture that we live in to buy into what is really a consumeristic holiday in the secular realm, some questions remain. As Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, will our hearts wander and leave the God we profess 
to love this Christmas season? Or will we love God with all our hearts and with all our souls and with all our minds, despite the pressures and the tension and the busyness of the 21st century cultural Christmas that we face? Well, I don't know. Those are good questions to ponder this season. Please turn your Bibles to Psalm 119 as we continue in, in our sermon series. By the way, this will be the last, uh, uh, the last video or the last message in Psalm 119 until the new year. As we move into Advent, we'll, we'll be doing some other things. So look for that. Psalm 119, verse 57. The Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. I entreat your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. When I think of my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. Though the cords of the wicked ensnare me, I do not forget your law. At midnight I rise to praise you because of your righteous rules. I am a companion of all who fear you, fear you of those who keep your precepts. The earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Teach me your statutes. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Lord, now as we turn our time and attention to your word, I, I thank you. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would give us uh, illumination on this text and that uh, what was written so long ago would become very practical and useful for us, especially as we move into this Christmas season. And with all this, we give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, as we begin to unpack the stanza here before us, we encounter or we are reminded of a key feature that we began with or tried to un understand at the beginning here in Psalm 119. The psalmist here in this stanza uses the eight basic words to describe the Word of God. Each verse from verse 57 through to 64, which we just read together, ends with such a synonym for the Word of God. And hopefully, as we've covered here almost 36% of Psalm 119 by the end of today, we've come to understand that what we have in our hands here uh, is more than words on a page. What the psalmist proclaimed from the very first Hebrew letter is that the word of God is a reflection of the character and nature of God, of the God he served. And when he, we encounter phrases like we have here at verse 57, I promise to keep your words, we understand that the direction the psalmist seeks from the word of God is an expression of God himself. In other words, what God wants for the psalmist in his life. Well, the writer to the Hebrews in the New Testament helps to make the point. The writer said, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. And the psalmist, who uh, long before the letter to the Hebrews was written, penned, was written, depended on the living and active word of God. I think I mixed that up a bit. I hope you got it. So we briefly touched here at verse 57. Now let's give our, this verse our full attention for a few moments. Let's read it together. The Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. Please notice with me the phrase, my portion. What was the psalmist saying? You know, when we survey uh, the, 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 uh, the Bible, the content of the Bible, we see the authors in the Bible sometimes referring to God as a portion. For example, David did. David one time said, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. Uh, we find that in Psalm 16, verse 5. Jeremiah, the author of Lamentations, said this, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. We go back to David, who was being pursued by King Saul. I don't know if you remember that story in the Old Testament. He was being pursued by King Saul. He, King Saul wanted him dead. And from the cave, with his 400 men of valor, he cries out. He said, I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. So we go back to our text here. What was the psalmist saying here at verse 57? Well, he was saying what he's been saying from the very beginning at verse 1 through to now and continues to the end of this psalm. God was his portion. And as we have already discovered throughout these 
initial verses, these 64 verses, that the psalmist had his own struggles and trials and tribulations and afflictions, externally and internally, externally from those around him and internally with his very own human selfish nature. And despite his circumstances, the psalmist, as one commentator put it so well, quote, draws near to God as his portion by committing to him. By seeking direction, by seeking support and understanding from the only place that he would find it, the word of God. Well, my friends, as we move uh, closer and deeper into the Christmas season this year, we will face a number of cultural dilemmas or tensions, if you will. For example, this whole instant gratification culture that we live in this entitlement culture that we live in, and certainly consumerism. It's a, it's, a, it's a lot about Black Fridays and Boxing Day sales, Christmas, in our culture. And then there's a more obvious one that sort of sticks right out, very obvious at least to some so, social scientists would call this the selfie syndrome. Or as I would like to refer to it, me, myself, and I-ism. Me, myself, and I-ism. And there's a good chance it's, if we're not careful, that some of us are going to wake up after Christmas facing 2024 with a bucket load of debt and 10 extra pounds around the waist and nothing else to show for it. So may I suggest that we enter the Christmas season with the same attitude as the psalmist. Same attitude as the psalmist. Look at verse 58. The psalmist said, I entreat your favor, whose favor? God's favor, with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. Let's look at the first half of the verse, 58a. The New International ver Version translates the original Hebrew this way, I have sought your face with all my heart. So the psalmist here is praying for the nearness of God with all who he is, with all his heart. King David also did this when he said, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears, Psalm 34.4. And the very same King David after bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, sang a song of thanksgiving. And you find that recorded for us in 1 Chronicles chapter 16. And I would recommend that you read it. Go there sometime today or tomorrow or during this Christmas season. And it's a marvelous, wonderful song to the Lord by King David. And in verse 11, King David said this, Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Here the psalmist is drawing near to God via the word of God and commits his way unto God. Let me say that one more time. The psalmist drawing near to God via the word of God commits his way unto God. This commitment to draw near to God finds its root internally in the psalmist, as we already heard, with all my heart. The psalmist's faith was firmly placed in God and his word. We turn to Isaiah the prophet in uh, chapter 55, and Isaiah the prophet there in that chapter is speaking about the compassion of God. My friends, this is the compassion of God who calls upon all to repent and return to him and to know him who said, my word that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing uh, which I sent it. And God's word accomplished what God purposed for the psalmist from the inside out. It changed the psalmist in a dynamic spiritual way. Changed his mind, his heart, his desires, his worldview, his understanding of sin. His whole person was changed. And we should notice that this internal, uh, uh, this internal renovation of the mind and heart that was made became manifest externally in his behavior. We see this in verse 59 to 60 where he said, When I think of my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. Again, we want to look at a specific phrase here at the beginning of verse 59, 59a. The phrase, when I think of my ways. And the meaning of the, he, of the, of the verb which is translated in the ESV, I think, in the original meaning from the Hebrew is to think upon, consider, 
to be mindful of. The New King James Version translates the Hebrew here as, I thought about my ways. The New International Version puts it this way, I have considered my ways. Well, friends, you might have heard of the saying, think before you act. Think before you act. You know, there's the story of a, uh, of a troubled teenager who was caught driving dad's car without a driver's license. And when the police officer asked the teenager, what were you thinking? The teenager, in a moment of honesty and clarity, replied, I wasn't, officer. Well, it might not, well, it might, excuse me, it may seem like a good idea that we ought to think before we act. This is not what verse 59 is teaching us. Yes, it appears that the psalmist had examined his ways, which, if you think about it, is a miracle in of itself. For the psalmist, like you and me, was prone to wander into the land of self-deception. You might be thinking now, well, what are we to do? Well, the answer is, do what the psalmist did. He turned his mind and his whole heart to the Word of God. He allowed the Word of God to examine his heart, examine his thinking, his mind. And in a culture that tells us to follow our hearts, to you be you, whatever the world that means, as followers of Christ, we would be wise to do as the psalmist did. To allow the Holy Spirit to examine our hearts and our minds in light of God's truth that is revealed in the Word of God. To put ourselves under the microscope of God's Word. That well, guaranteed, convict us and change us. To put aside the ugly pride and False humility in the wandering hearts and to humble ourselves before a holy and just God this Christmas season. And God will change the inside so that the outside will walk the walk, talk the talk, and do as Jesus would do. So this Advent, we can do as the psalmist did. Hasten and not delay to obey your commands, verse 60. Well, we're moving into verse 61. The psalmist, holding fast to God's direction, introduces us to what he called the wicked. The wicked. And please note, wicked in the biblical sense is not in the same sense that it's gained popularity in our culture as a slang word for wicked cool. You see, the wicked of Psalm 119 are those who are hostile and disobedient, disobedient to God. And the phrase, the cords of the wicked, can refer literally or figuratively to a rope or a shackle or a snare. And with this in mind, and considering the context, uh, we can reason and understand the psalmist, as one commentator put it, quote, is referring to the traps and schemes made by evil people. Here's the thing about evil people, you, you can't tell from the outside. Anyways, I digress. But, and this is an important but, the psalmist, despite the opposition, said, I do not forget your law. Verse 61b. In the face of apparent opposition, he actively followed God's direction. He actively followed God's direction. You know, when we think about our own lives, we may not be experiencing direct opposition, yet experiencing direct opposition for our faith in Christ. But as we already alluded to and talked about, we will encounter a culture that loves the idea of Christmas, but not the reason for Christmas. And when we think about that, uh, folks, I don't think we should blame them for it. After all, why shouldn't a secular culture love the idea of Christmas? Because it's an idea that has been crafted and designed over the decades by secular people. It has nothing to do with the real story of Christmas found in the scriptures. And we shouldn't fault them for wanting to celebrate love and family and generosity and kindness and hope for a peaceful world. These are good things to desire and want. But this is, but, and this is another important but, how are the sons and daughters of God to approach the Christmas season? How is the church to approach the Christmas season? How are we to engage the secular culture this Christmas? May I suggest we do what the psalmist did. At midnight, I rise to give thanks for your righteous laws. What was the psalmist doing here in the face of opposition? In his context. 
Well, you can go back to what he said in verse 7 at the beginning. The psalmist said, I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn of your righteous rules. What should we do through Advent and into Christmas? Here's an idea. Give praise to God who sent his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would receive eternal life. There's something to celebrate this Christmas. What a gift that God has given the world. A world that really and only truly deserves the judgment and wrath of God. God offered true everlasting peace from the one We get this from the one who created the world, who created families. God, who is love, extends his mercy, his grace, his wonder, working power to change our eternal destinies. Now that's something to praise God for this Christmas. And the psalmist went even further. Here at verse 63, he said, I am a friend to all who fear you, to all who follow your precepts. I'm a friend. And let's start by dispelling any erroneous ideas concerning the fear of God once and for all. First, we should tremble. Absolutely, we should tremble before a holy and just God. It seems to me that many who call themselves Christians today in our Christian culture have lost the holy fear of God. The Apostle Paul reminds us that all have fallen short of the glory of God. There's none who are right before God. No, not one. That's what Romans 3 teaches us. My friends, we can only offer God one thing. Not our times, our time, our talent, or treasure. He gives us those. He offered those to us. He gives us those. We can only offer our sin. But because of God's amazing grace and mercy, God, who is rich in love, while you and I were still dead in our sin, made us alive together with Jesus Christ. That's Ephesians chapter 2. And the fear of God then takes on a whole new dimension, my friends. One of gratitude and thankfulness and joy and holy reverence and awe. Well, let's go back to our text. You see, the psalmist joined the fellowship of those in his context who honored and held on to God's word. This is the unity that God brings to his people. Our union with Jesus Christ unites all the people of God into one family. And as we enter the Advent season and move into Christmas, may we take the time to prepare and celebrate together as a people of God the gift that is Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah of God. Well, my friends, this brings us to our conclusion, to verse 64, where the psalmist said, The earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Teach me your statutes. What we have here is a bookend. The psalmist began by saying that God was his portion in verse 57. We could say something about the language structure there, but I'm not going to. And now the psalmist, after knowing the goodness of God and the joy of fellowship with the people of God, ends with the steadfast love of God, has said. And the root word for Hebrew that is translated steadfast love means show yourself merciful. And the New King James Version goes this way when it translates verse 64 this way. The earth, O Lord, is full of your mercy. You know, one one can wonder if the psalmist casts his thoughts to the story of his people in the Exodus as he penned verse 64. We go to Exodus chapter 34 and there we find Moses on Mount Sinai with two new stone tablets. We don't have time to explain what happened to the two original ones. But the story is there for you to read. But in chapter 34, the text describes God descending in the cloud. And God passed before Moses and said this of himself. Pardon me, said this of himself. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. And as God, my friends, was merciful and loving in the time of the Exodus, He was the same in the time of the psalmist. He is the same in our time. For indeed, the whole earth is full of the love of God. Just people need to open their hearts and eyes to it. And as we move into Advent and prepare to celebrate Christmas among the tension and distractions of our culture in the season, let us pause and join the choir of angels who so long ago praised God And sing with them this song. 
Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Let us pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this message. Thank you, Lord, for the gift that you gave this world, your son, Jesus Christ. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good day. Shalom.